Good afternoon, Lace Jump, and I'm John, this is many a true nerd, and welcome back to Fallout Tale of Two Wastelands, where last time, we dug into the secret world of the Enclave. Their plans, their motivations, their secret science experiments, and today, we're going to be diving into a much smaller story, but one that's got a whole bunch of interesting secrets all of its own. And today we're starting off much nearer by to home. We're barely around the corner from Arafu or Megaton. That right there below me, that's Moresti train station. So uh, yes indeed, we're in a nice, easily accessible part of the map. And the reason I'm up on this particular ridge is, yes, this is the only way to access a location that is, uh, to an extent, hidden away in the rocks right here in the wasteland. The only way to access it being uh, this bridge right here, though uh, the giant radio antenna does somewhat give the game away. So let's just uh, mosey on over in this direction uh, and say hello to an absolute bloody star of a character. Oh yes, today we're going to be meeting up with uh, Agatha. Oh my! I wasn't expecting any visitors. Agatha is delightful. She's uh, so polite, she's just wonderful. But my favourite thing about Agatha is uh, that's not necessarily true, actually. Agatha is uh, very sensitive uh, to how you speak to her, which is something I really wish showed up more often in Bethesda games. Fallout 4 in particular is uh, very bad at this, where it doesn't matter how rude or sarcastic or offensive or downright psychotic you are, every character will just politely overlook it because uh, they just sort of know in the back of their minds uh, that you're the protagonist so you get a free pass. In Fallout 3, that was not always the case. We were discussing, yeah, a couple of weeks back, Dusk over in the Brotherhood of Steel, who will 100% not tolerate any nonsense that you try and give her. And Agatha is just the same. If you're not as polite to her as she is to you, you can scupper her entire mission before it even begins. My, my, my. You certainly do look a little bit worn out from your travels. Oh, just look at my terrible manners. I'm Agatha. It's so nice to meet you. Now, what brings you all the way out here? Seriously, she's so absolutely bloody lovely, it's marvellous. But no, 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 no. Just for a moment in Evil Mirror Universe B, let's be as rude to Agatha as we possibly can. So, uh, screw you, Agatha. I'm not telling you anything. <laughs> well, I see you have manners I'd come to expect from a wasteland dweller. All I've done is offer you safe harbour in my home. No need to get testy with me, young lady. And there we go, immediately her super polite tone becomes a, a lot more annoyed. So, at this point you can apologise and sort of a reset your reputation with her if you like. But no, let's double down and keep being a dick. That's just about all I'm going to take from the likes of you. When you walked in, I thought you were different than the normal riffraff that crawls out of the sand. I see now that I was wrong. No, I'm sorry. I tried to be nice to you and you decided to make fun of me. Well. This old lady doesn't put up with those shenanigans. And there we flipping go. Agatha's decided at this point she is done with you for now. And just out of interest, I've moved time forward 24 hours and she's still refusing to speak to me. So uh, I'm pretty sure at this point, yes, she will now just not deal with me. So back in Universe A, where we're not going to be a monster to Agatha, there is one opportunity to do a bit of a do-over with her. Which is, uh, yes, if she's about to kick you out, you can just say, Oh, I'm so sorry. The heat must be getting to me. I apologise. And she is uh, very gracious about that. <sighs> My husband told me once to always forgive and forget. I suppose I should take that advice now. Rest his poor soul. Consider the apology accepted. And your harsh words forgotten. There we go. Much better back into the conversation proper, though. That doesn't mean, you know, we're not going to still be a bit rude. Because uh, Agatha has got some wonderful lines. So uh, if you sort of imply you might be about to rob her... Watch the sass, Captain Sassy Pants. I can still hold my own if I have to. My husband made me learn a thing or two about how to defend myself. Besides, I have a caravan come through here about once a week. They'd miss me if I was gone. So, number one, watch the sass Captain Sassy Pants is an amazing response, and two, she's not actually lying. The caravans do actually rotate past her shack, sometimes you'll see them standing outside. In fact, when I actually arrived at this location, Crazy Wolfgang was chilling out right outside, which is marvellous. So Agatha, let's get down to business. What do you have to trade? Besides shelter? Well, I offer something in the way of entertainment. 
I play songs on my homemade violin and people trade me goods. If not in person, I use my husband's old radio set. The men in the caravan say it keeps their morale up on lonely nights in the wasteland. And this, by the way, I absolutely flipping adore. The way that Agatha survives in the post-apocalypse, because uh, it's a really cool insight into how the post-apocalypse economy works in Fallout in general, which is uh, we have got a very primitive barter economy with not that many goods floating around. So uh, how do people actually survive uh, day to day? Well, naturally, people are going to have to find specialised skills uh, and trade those skills uh, for goods. In Agatha's case, she's good at playing the violin, so she can trade entertainment for enough goods to keep her alive and... And uh, I wish we got more of this, because there are so many characters in Fallout, both old and newer, where it's unclear precisely how it is they survive, what it is they do, how they afford to eat and live. So uh, it's just really cool to get this character here who gives us a very clear idea as to uh, what skills she has uh, and how she trades them to survive. It's marvellous. So uh, let's get down to business, because uh, a homemade violin isn't going to sound exactly right, is it, Agatha? Oh, you are a clever one. Yes, that's exactly the problem that I have with it. It doesn't quite play all of the notes correctly, and I have to constantly tinker with it. My trading depends on my violin. Without it, I have nothing to play, no way to make music. If you can bring me a violin, a better one, I'd feel much more secure. And we can certainly do that, but go on. Back to being a little bit on the rude side, I'll get you a damn moon rock if you pay me enough, Agatha. All I can offer you is the same I offer the caravans that trade with me. The frequency of my radio and the promise of beautiful music. And Agatha, that's lovely, but I'm going to be needing something a bit more real before I get out there and find you a violin. You have a point. Perhaps I've been neglecting needs that you might have and being selfish. I have a small amount of ammunition that my husband left behind. A box of odds and ends. I don't think I've opened it in years. If you do this for me, you're welcome to take whatever you need. And there we go. We get some ammo up front. There is a promise of a radio station if we complete the mission. And uh, pay very close attention to the wording of your agreement to this mission, which is, uh, I give you my word, I'll do my best to recover a violin for you, because, uh, oh, we're not done being a dick to Agatha yet, by the way. Oh, I don't think I've been this happy in years. As promised, here's the key to the ammunition box. It's right under the radio table. Before you leave, I have some information that may help you. At least a place to begin. It all starts with my great-great-grandmother Hilda back in 2077, before the bombs fell. And we do actually want to get this story, because yes, Agatha's story and the story associated with it is really rather interesting. Hilda sent a good deal of letters to my great-grandmother Mary, who passed them on, and so forth. Hilda was quite a special woman, classically trained and exceptionally talented at the violin. Her pride and joy was her Stradivarius violin. I can only imagine how exquisite this instrument must have been. When the war reared its head, she was invited by Vault Tech into Vault 92. They claimed the vault would be dedicated to preserving musical talent. Which certainly does seem, yes, a little bit suspicious given everything we know about vault Tech. vault Tech was always promoting the vaults being used for the preservation of the arts and all that nonsense. Hilda couldn't pass on a chance to meet many of the other musical talents of the world, so she accepted their invitation. Then the bombs fell, the vault was sealed, and my family never heard from her again. You certainly do get the impression that Agatha is, at least to some extent, suspicious of vault Tech's motives. And understandably, yes, she's right to be. She kept it in a special pressurized case. Inside the case is the perfect temperature and humidity for the instrument. If the case is still functioning, the Stradivarius would be in perfect shape. Hilda Stradivarius was named the Swa Stradivarius. All of them had names. That's what I want you to get. So there we flipping go. Vault 92 and, uh, hilariously, Agatha doesn't know where it is. I'd suggest making her way to Vault Tech headquarters in the DC ruins. That would be a good place to begin. Good luck!
And that's a fun thing about this mission, that there are so many different ways to do it, because uh, you can just stumble across Vault Knights 2, it's just out there, we already know where it is in fact, Vault Tech Headquarters, as she just said, though that is deep, deep in the DC ruins, uh, or alternatively, if you've already made it far enough into the main plot, you can just go to the Brotherhood, uh, their Vault Tech Terminal will give you the same information, so there are multiple ways to locate the vaults. Still, just uh, one more thing, just, you know, maybe leading into one possibility that we might be wishing to pursue when this is all over. Yes, Agatha, the Stradivarius. Now, by any chance, is such a rare item incredibly bloody valuable? I hope you're not thinking of doing anything dishonest. You gave me your word. Yes, I'd imagine it would fetch an incredible sum of caps to someone that was knowledgeable in musical history. I doubt the average merchant would even realise what they were holding. So, yes indeed, just uh, something to keep in the back of your mind there. So, that's all the business we've got with Agatha for now, brilliant. We have got her ammo box right here, and uh, you know what? That's not even that bad, I will happily take most of that. And yes indeed, luckily for us, we've already been to Vault Tech Headquarters, so we know precisely where we're going though. Yes, this mission can be a bit on the mean side, which is to say you can stumble across Agatha's house really, really early on. It is uh, nearby to Minefield, it's nearby to Moresti, so uh, plenty of really early game missions uh, can just bring you right up to it. And Vault Tech Headquarters is actually pretty easy to get to as well, simply because, yeah, it's barely around the corner from Chevy Chase East, where you go very early on in the story too, so it feels like a really early game mission. Right up to the point where the game says, okay, now just go and explore Old Olney. No, don't ask what's in Old Olney. I'm sure it's all fine. So, yes, this mission can be a bit of a mean one, and uh, we could teleport right there, but no. No, 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 no. There's one thing I want to check out on the way. Just starting off at the giant power station right next to Minefield. Yes, we're going to be heading uh, straight to Old Olney and Vault 92. But on the way, there is a location that's got some rather interesting lore attached to it. Though, interestingly, lore that was only added in later retroactively. Here we go, a giant stinking crater out in the middle of nowhere. One, a danger, high radiation warning sign right here. And the game is not bloody kidding about that. So, probably best we just uh, pop some Radex and a rat away, marvellous, before we head inside, and uh, yes indeed, welcome to Greener Pastures Disposal Sites. And as I say, this area's got something rather interesting going on, and uh, the interesting thing is, uh, there was nothing interesting about this area when Fallout 3 came out in 2008. In fact, my favourite source of a sort of but not really canonical information, the Fallout 3 strategy guide, uh, has nothing to say about this area. It is just a big radioactive dump, very literally. Which isn't to say you don't want to come here, you 100% do, because this indeed is the source of a beautiful bobble head right there, and oh bloody hell. I will take running 5% faster, that's amazing! And meanwhile on the far side of the dump, just uh, yes, mosey on towards uh, that shipping container over there. You might just be able to see the door on the side from here. And chilling out here, we find the uniquely named Wasteland Recluse. Just, you know, in his little rat bunker right in the middle of a radioactive dump. Probably feeling very safe indeed, but um, he probably shouldn't have done, actually. His rat suit is not good condition and honestly doesn't provide that much radiation resistance. He probably died from rats anyway, and it probably didn't even take that long. Okay, fairly unremarkable location, just a toxic dump where you can get a couple of skill books. And as far as Fallout 3 is concerned, that's all it is. However, that all changed in 2010 when Fallout New Vegas came along and retroactively added additional flavour to this area because... In Dead Money, there's a terminal that's worried about the cheaply built ventilation system in the Sierra Madre. Warning, very accurately it turns out, that if it ran unsupervised for a few years, it could create a disaster. A disaster specifically as serious as greener pastures. Suggesting the greener pastures is not just a random dump in the middle of nowhere, but instead this toxic dump was some form of major scandal. So huge that even on the far coast of America, it was still the first environmental disaster that came to mind for the people installing various systems in Sierra Madre, which is really rather bloody fascinating. So yeah, for basically no reason whatsoever, when they were making one of the DLCs for New Vegas, somebody decided that this random, tiny, unremarkable area in Fallout 3 was actually significantly more important than Fallout 3 thought it was, which I think is super cute. 
And here we go, just round the corner from our old Oni, trying not to get spotted by various death claws. We have got Vault 92 hidden away nicely out of the way, and uh, I will say, I did much prefer the compass system back in the days of Fallout 3, before we went over to, yes, a very distinct readable icons in Fallout 4, because uh, it just made it way too easy to spot vaults in Fallout 4. You knew there was a vault, even if you were half a mile away from it. The very simple tiny compass ticks that you didn't know what you were going towards, uh, they just made it much easier to hide really cool stuff. And speaking of really cool stuff, uh, welcome to Vault 92, because... Uh, Bloody hell, this place is uh, wonderful. There is uh, so much story and lore and audio tapes and everything put into this area. It is marvellous. In fact, it's one of the most well-developed vaults in the game. Like, I'd say more so than Vault 87. So much work has been put into the story here, even though it is so, so far out the way, and only a very small, relatively hard to stumble across submission would ever send you here. And speaking of which, right here in the very starting room, Professor Malleus Audio Log V92-01. So far, the experiment is going exactly as planned. We are subjecting the residents to extremely low-frequency white noise and regular intervals through the loudspeaker system. Using the soundproof recording studios and the musicians was an inspired idea. <laughs> Kudos to the vault Tech Selection Committee on their shrewdness. So there we go, something was being broadcast at the musicians inside the recording booths, and uh, this does of course sync up with everything we've seen about Vault 92 in Vault Tech headquarters, and indeed in the Citadel. And I love this vault. This vault is brilliant, not just because it tells a really interesting story with a couple of twists in it, though we'll be getting to that when we get to that, but no, it's also really mechanically interesting. Which is when you first arrive, if you just show up as, you know, a baby level 1 character who can't really do anything, there's only one way you can go. You turn right, you come in, and you head to either the reactor room or the living quarters. However, this is a dungeon where someone was flexing their RPG chops, because that's not the only way to go. Instead, this dungeon is wide open. If you've got the skills, you can skip straight to the end. So turn left instead and we get ourselves an average locked door. So characters with lock picker 50 can start skipping ahead immediately. So that gets me through that door and as a result I'm in another room that's got access to the reactor because uh, even more fun thing about this area, if when you first come in you turn right and then turn right again, you can cut into the reactor and the reactor is entirely a shortcut letting you bypass that 50 lock pick chat. It is, however, yes, yeah, swimming in a mile at Kings if you're even a remotely high level. So, um, yes, don't expect an easy ride in here. But seriously, I just absolutely love this area. How, yes, you can either use a 50 lock pick to skip straight ahead, or alternatively, if you don't have that, you can skip straight ahead anyway, but you've got to cut through the extremely dangerous reactor to do it. A reactor that simultaneously, you'll notice, is very flooded, meaning there is an in-universe reason why this place is infested with Myalurks, who we'll be running into in much greater numbers down the line. Oh, this vault is bloody elegant. So yeah, two ways to get to this room right here, then just mosey on around the corridor, and we can skip straight to the end. Sound testing. Beautiful. Though do be a bit on the careful side, because, uh, yes, as I say, once you get deeper and deeper in, you are dealing with uh, more and more flipping creatures uh, dodged about. So, uh, yes, Milo Hunters, never a fun time. Always a little bit on the uh, tricky to deal with, but fortunately, Victory Rifle can knock them over. Same as anything else, which is marvellous. So basically, screw you, I'm just going to shoot you in the eye until you fall over. Lovely. Though just out of interest, I'm curious whether you could full-on stealth this mission. So, okay, just uh, pop a stealth boy the moment we arrive into uh, sound testing. Sneak around this area as best we can. Just keep your distance from the Myalurks. Let them walk straight past me, if you would be so kind, buddy. Okay, now he's just walking away from me. Well, that's just bloody irritating. Just a sneak around here. Sneak around this way. Head downstairs. Because, yes, this area is uh, not too complicated, really. It's pretty bloody simple. Mosey on round to uh, the recording studios. A couple of Myalogs and whatnot floating all. Okay, you might need to die, potentially. Because I do need to get past you. 
Okay, just shut the door so no one else minds. Fine, one person needs to die. No problemo whatsoever. Possibly with maxed out sneak, we could have pulled that off. Just go up to computer. Open the recording studio. Gone away. Round to the other side of this same area. No problemo whatsoever. And in the recording studio, right here, you have got the violin. So you can just go in, grab that, walk straight back out again. Yeah, lockpick 50, one stealth boy. Not too difficult to just complete this mission like that. And I know what you're thinking, John, you haven't actually completed the mission properly at all, have you? Because that's not everything Agatha needs. She also wants the sheet music that's located in the living quarters, so you've got to go and get that. And that's not actually true. Agatha needs some sheet music. But it doesn't need to be the sheet music in Vault 92. It could be any sheet music whatsoever. And the wasteland is swimming in the stuff. In fact, we've already walked pretty much straight past two separate instances of it. Good old Arlington Library that we cleared out long ago. Just mosey straight on back inside and then I head upstairs where we're aiming for, yes, the children's wing. Just take a right at the first junction, past the nuka machine into this lovely office right here and... Uh, Oh, what do you know? It's flipping sheep music. Though to my mind, what's much more amusing is uh, literally one of the first locations you find in the game also contains the sheep music. So there's Vault 101 just up the road. We are right here in Springvale and yes, just mosey along until we reach Springvale School. Stay nice and low and peaceful if you can. No reason to, yeah, cause trouble with all the ones outside round the back. We don't need to be causing any issues with them whatsoever. Instead, we are going straight in at the front door. Right here, lovely. Might be a handful of raiders dotted about somewhere. Then just jam mosey straight into the hallway. Out for trouble. Take a right. Keep on keeping on. And once again, looks like we're going to have a one a raider who needs to go down. But oh dear. Poor little baby early area raider is not going to do very well against my mega crit build. Marvelous. Just take you down nice and fast, buddy. And there we go. Round the back of the desk in one of the very first rooms of the game's the very first dungeon that you might well stumble across. There you go. Sheet music book right there that you can just, you know, keep in your inventory until you're ready to sell it to Agatha. Still, funny old thing about Agatha, which is, uh, yes, as she indicated to me previously, one, the violin's worth a huge pile of money, and two, she can't actually pay you the money it's worth because, uh, well, she doesn't have any money. She trades her musical abilities uh, for goods. So as a result of that, all she can give you is access to her radio station, and that means uh, there are indeed other people in the world uh, who are gonna pay more. The game just doesn't tell you about them. Though I will admit, option number one is a bit of a wild card, which is, uh, yes, the bartender, Azrakal, in Underworld, uh, he is apparently in the market for an extremely valuable violin. Here you go, buddy. Could I maybe interest you in a unique, genuine Stradivarius violin? Do I look like I play in a fucking orchestra? Why should I care? I mean, he's not wrong. This is a very odd thing to bring to him. But if we just kind of, you know, try and tempt him a bit, saying it's a rare artifact, it would be unique in all the world, etc., etc. One of a kind, huh? I like the sound of that. Okay, I'll give you 200 caps for it. And believe me, that's generous. Seriously, it is kind of weird that he's willing to buy it at all, but yes, you can sell it to the bartender in Underworld for some reason. Option number two makes a lot more sense, which is, yes indeed, we're back here in Rivet City. Because seriously, there is no end to the stuff that good old Abraham Washington will pay good money for. Incredible! I've heard of those items. They were used to make music many, many years ago, I believe. Well, although it has no American historical significance, I can take it off your hands for 200 caps. How does that sound? So yes, indeed, he's hardly a music lover, but at the bare minimum, he does understand its historical significance. And uh, you can also see there, yes, his speech check is a fair whack harder than the one in Underworld. So uh, yeah, 200 or 300 caps, honestly, not that much. But we're going to do it anyway, because... Uh, Bloody hell, Agatha is not amused by this. So, Agatha, 
Fun fact, I just sold the violin to somebody else who has no particular interest in playing it whatsoever. You son of a bitch! You know what that thing meant to me? It was a family heirloom. It belonged rightfully in the hands of a musician. Someone to appreciate its value, not to exploit it. I can't believe you'd stab an old woman in the back like this. Now get out. Get out of here this instant! And once again, we have now firmly burnt our bridges with Agatha. I told you to get the hell out and I meant it. She's done with us, except for one fun, interesting final bloody twist of the tale. If you feel really bad about what's happened to Agatha, you can then go back to whoever you sold it to and buy it back off them. However, if you only sold it for 200 caps, naturally, they're going to take you for a bit of a rider and it needs to be 300, which means that you do break even in the event you pass the speech check. It takes Moxie to admit you've done something wrong. I admire that. I'd be glad to sell it back to you. Here you go. So there we go. We've now got the Stradivarius back again. Hmm. What's that you're carrying? Is it something else to taunt me with? And yes, indeed it is, Agatha, because you can now go back to her with the violin, meaning she will now speak to you if it turns out you just feel a bit bad about, you know, what you did previously. You actually got it back. I didn't think you'd bother after that stunt you pulled. It's like holding a piece of history in the palm of my hands. Amazing. Simply amazing. It may have been like pulling teeth, but at least you finally brought me the thing. Still, I'm lacking a suitable reward for what you've done. All I can give you is the frequency to my radio set. Tune in whenever you feel like listening to the strains of an old woman's violin playing. And there we flipping go. We can now ask her to play the violin and... Uh, amazingly, I just gained karma. I feel like I do not deserve that karma. Okay, I was a dick to the greatest extent possible. I was basically just tormenting her during this entire process. And yes, indeed, Agatha, how about we talk about writing your music down? Well, I only need two things, my noggin and some music paper. Would you believe, Agatha, I've got both right here, and because I'm in a good mood, I'm not even going to set them on fire in front of you. My word, you actually found some real music paper. I didn't even think it possible. Yet here it is. You've really outdone yourself this time. I knew getting the Stradivarius was a challenge, but this is just incredible. This is all too much. You deserve more than just a pat on the back. I'm not 100% sure why Agatha thinks this was more difficult than getting the violin. The violin was at the bottom of an ancient vault right next to Old Olney filled with My Alert Kings. That is much, much nastier than just going to the school next to Megaton to pick it up from the first classroom. Well, like I told you before, I don't have wealth out here in the sticks, but I can certainly provide you something useful. My husband left me something else beside the radio setup. I think you'll find it useful. It's his old pistol. He tinkered with it some and used to practice with it all the time. Now I want you to have it. And there we flipping go. We finally get a unique gun for our trouble. And there we flipping go. Sheep music disappears and Black Hawk gets added. And it is a really bloody nice gun. Damage 58, DPS well over 150. It's a great old gun. Light, effective, and with this mod, not even that difficult to use. The only downside being it does share an ammo type with Lincoln's repeater, and uh, honestly, I can't imagine a scenario where I'd choose to use Blackhawk over Lincoln's repeater. It's just a better gun. And as we step outside, there we flipping go, Agatha's station is now available. And as much as I joke, I think this is actually a really lovely reward. Like, having a brand new radio station added into your radio, so you've got a different genre of music to listen to as you're going around the wasteland, that is a lovely, unique reward. Like, if anything, I wish it happened more often. I wish you could find a way to generate a unique jazz station or rock and roll station, just so you could really customise your soundtrack to be whatever you wanted it to be. It's just, oh, it's lovely. They say recent events have made the world seem like a better place. I hope all of you out there can smile and feel better knowing that it's true. Plus, Agatha is just 
delightfully wholesome. She's actually just a really charming DJ. And technically, that's all we need to do. We're done with Vault 92. But no, 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 no. We're going to discover the secret of this here vault. And that means uh, we're diving in a bit deeper. Just, uh, yes, head uh, straight on from where you started. Uh, and we've got ourselves uh, another lovely average locked door right over here. Marvellous. Just a handful of blow flies. Uh, to my mind, you know what? It's appropriate to take these guys out with my black hawk because I've just got it. So, uh, boom for you. Boom for you too. Uh, lovely. We're in the main central area of the vault right now. Marvellous. You could also probably argue this is the easiest way to actually go if you want to get in and out with minimal trouble. So, uh, yeah, just sneak in that door. You get to the open big vault plaza area right here. Handful of blowflies, nothing dramatic there. Just take the first left and you'll be straight back round to sound testing. And that brings you, yes, over on the left-hand side of sound testing. And given, yeah, the control for recording studio is about there... And recording studio is this building right here. You do start a tiny bit nearer by to the recording studio than going this way. So uh, this might be an even nicer way to do it. But don't worry about that for now. Instead, yes, we're trying to figure out why it is a vault full of musicians uh, is instead full of uh, skeletons, uh, blood, uh, barricades, etc, etc. What precisely went on here? Well, just mosey on upstairs to the overseer's office and we get ourselves a bit of a multi-part answer. So, step one, Malleus's audio log and number two. I'm a bit encouraged by the latest batch of data. Seems that 33% of the subjects are now lapsing into a trance-like state on occasion. When in this state, we're fairly certain that suggestion and programming of the subject can be applied. We've begun testing this by implanting subtle cues in affected subjects making them scratch their ear or constantly fix their hair. So far, I'm happy to report a 100% success rate on this implementation method. So okay, the story starts to come into focus. Voltet was running an experiment to implant suggestions into the musicians. Why pick this vault? Because it had soundproof recording studios, so they could do it under very controlled circumstances. All makes sense. And right here in the overseer's office, we've got log number three. <sighs> disaster today. One of our test subjects, V920717, has murdered three other residents in a fit of unbridled rage, the likes of which I've never seen. It took almost 23 shots before the security team took him down. This subject has no history of violence or mental instability whatsoever. My concern is that this subject is one of our most successful implant recipients, able to execute complex instructions during a trance state. So okay, that's where it all starts to go wrong. People start doing a bit of a violence, murder, etc, etc, etc. And while we happen to be in the overseer's office, how about we just just dig through his emails a bit. So, as per instruction, the broadcast equipment for the white noise has been rerouted from the sound booths and tied directly to the entire Vault's loudspeaker system. I'll now be able to execute the Vault Tech Confidential Plan. White noise mind suggestion combat experimentation. I have three of Professor Malleus's team doing what I need to get done and hope to show some concrete results soon. I had the engineers make it so the white noise could be triggered from the control center or at the local security consoles. The password to these consoles is a UIY2249. So okay, we've now got the passwords. The results are even better than I expected. The sheer strength and tenacity of combat suggestion implanted test subjects is incredible. Imagine an entire army of people who would never disobey a direct order from High Commander and can fight until it takes over 20 bullets to stop them. So, uh, yes indeed. Like, the experiment was already deeply sinister. But when you put it this way, using white noise to turn people into basically mindless slaves who could be used as perfect soldiers, uh, arguably it's one of the most sinister experiments Bolt Tech ever conducted. Especially given it actually seems to have at least somewhat worked. And now we reach the point we got to with Malleus's tapes up to number three. Malleus says it's a failure, so there's been a few deaths. One step back, two steps forward. It's easy to suppress what everyone in the vault is calling crazies. I've added a command word into their suggestion implants. Simply say the phrase, sanity is not statistical, and they stop dead in their tracks. I've informed the guards of this, and I've told them to only use it when out of earshot of anybody else. So okay an override implanted into the people who were starting to go a bit bananas. 
If you're curious about the expression, sanity is not statistical, by the way, it's from 1984, and broadly means the truth is not subject to majority consensus, i.e. if 99% of people are wrong, they're still wrong. So I guess the implication is like supposed to be the code word snaps them out of the trance and thus restores them to the truth, but it's a bit of a stretch perhaps. I'd argue maybe someone at Bethesda just thought it sounded cool. And here's where we get to the giant pile of corpses. The command phrase is no longer working against the crazies. I don't know what the hell happened. I'm losing control of the situation. If we don't get things under control soon, we're going to have a huge revolt on our hands. Malice is inciting the rest of the vault into action. I'm afraid by the power invested in me by the Vault Tech Corporation, I have no choice but to have him killed. What a waste. So there we go. The experiment in fact had two levels. Malleus thought he was just setting up a very localised control test. This guy was just exposing everyone in the vault at the same time. And unfortunately, it turns out that was the mistake. Had it been a small number of people tested thoroughly, they might have been able to work out the snags. But as one, it was everybody. And two, the only person who was putting together a solid defence, Malleus, was assassinated. Yeah, there wasn't really much of a chance. And just like in Vault 101, the Overseer's Terminal itself gives us access to the Secret Overseer Tunnel. Marvelous. So that just uh, rises up. Beautiful. And yes, once again, we can just nip straight downstairs with that. Giving me the third and final entry point to sound testing. So yes, one might reasonably assume in the original vault, this door was kept locked at all times, given it leads into the general corridors, but this equipment right here is presumably, yes, originally what created the white noise in the recording booths, but then the overseer had it redirected to the general speakers. Oh, and fun fact before we leave the Overseer's office, basically, yes, everyone in this vault is named after a real-life music producer or composer. In this case, producer Rick Rubin. So, with the passwords in hand, how about we nip back round to, yes, the living quarters, though going into them up from the rear. This is the area you would be working towards if you had to go the wrong way round, because you didn't know how to do any lock picking whatsoever. And this area is, as you may well notice, yes, once again, absolutely flipping swarming in my likes. But don't you flipping worry about that, because uh, the noise can actually be used to your advantage. Just uh, nip round the corner. We've got ourselves one uh, security terminal right here. So how about we just uh, very quickly do a noise flush? So there we go, initiating sound sequence. And in just a second, uh, everyone is going to calm down, because the Maya lurks in this area can't stand the noise. Literally every enemy in this area is dead. Though unfortunately, yes, you don't get the XP for it. Still, with the locals dealt with, our destination is uh, straight downstairs to the security hub. Not least as now we know what's going on, poor old Professor Malleus, log number four, is down over here, nearby to the medical wing. Unbelievable! We've had 12 more incidents in the past month mirroring Subject V92071's actions. The shocking part is the savagery these aberrants exhibit when they murder. They rip their victims apart limb from limb and eviscerate them by hand. These used to be respected members of the musical community. How could this be happening? Where have I gone wrong? There is certainly a bit of tragedy in Professor Malleus believing he's responsible for all the deaths when, yes, it was the Overseer and Vault Tech who did it all, though maybe not so much of a tragedy, given the lad did sign up to do incredibly unethical, non-consensual experimentation on young musicians, even if he thought, you know, the signals he was implanting were fairly benevolent. It's still incredibly immoral. And speaking of which, yes, inside the lab, presumably Professor Malleus's office, we've got his emails to the Overseer. We have a serious problem on our hands, and you've yet to answer my last several intravolt mails or even see me. I have seven more dead. Three of the Vault 92 residents have suffered the same symptoms as subject V920717. How many more of these people have to die before you realise we're in deep trouble? We're alone out here, no one will come to our rescue. If anyone's left, we have to deal with this ourselves. Uh, please, I beg you to see me immediately and call your goon squad off your living area doors. So yes, indeed, we saw the barricade just inside the overseer's office. Basically, he barricaded himself in and went into denial after it all started going wrong. And finally, section four is under heavy guard now. I can't even get in without a personal escort. 
It's my estimate over 30% of the vault population is now clinically insane and poses a real danger to the rest of us. We have to consider the possibility we may need to abandon the vault completely. Better to take a chance outside than in here. You still won't speak to me and any attempt I've made to see you has ended in scuffles with your guards. It's obvious something's going on. I'm going to find out what. And though it's not explicitly stated, we might reasonably assume that some form of last stand occurred, yes, in this bit of the world. Given we've got multiple skeletons in the corridor leading into the security section. And on top of that, yes, in this lab over here, we've got clearly somebody doing some form of work to the speakers. Combine that with, yes, pulse mines and pulse grenades, it's possible they thought that, yes, maybe by hitting the speakers with an EMP, they could snap the people out of it, or adjusting them to reverse the frequency, I don't know, but it's how I choose to read this area. And all of this, of course, brings us ultimately back down to sound testing, where, yes, rather unsettlingly, we do get to, uh, yes, get an account of what it was like to experience this nonsense firsthand. I've been feeling a bit sick lately, kind of woozy after playing in the studio usually, get so stuffy in that place, but I'm sure it's worth it. I know I'm getting better just from watching my fellow violinist's techniques. They don't even mind giving me pointers. Tonight, a bunch of us girls from the string section are going down to the rec hall for a dance. I hope that cute sound guy Parker asked me to dance. He's dreamy. So okay, all perfectly normal, just some headaches, I'm sure it's not a problem. I'm not feeling very good, I can't concentrate, I went to Dr. Benison's office, he just said it's stress, and to take it easy for a while, I think all the time I'm spending in the sound studio is making me tired, I can barely type anymore, I'm shaking so much. Someone could reasonably assume that maybe Dr. Benison's was in on it. And then finally, barely coherent, help me, lost my mind, stop them, get out of my head, something of that nature. Then we could just nip over the road for, here we go, Professor Malleus Log number 5. The situation is getting out of hand. Over half the population of the vault is exhibiting savage tendencies. You can only assume our noise experimentation has awakened some dormant part of their psyche, brought their primitive nature to the surface. In essence, I feel that they are almost psychologically devolving. I was stupid for rushing these experiments. Now over 35 people are dead. And once again, Malleus blaming himself. But as we get to the final tape down here, just opposite the recording studio itself. I can't believe what I've discovered. Just before he died, one of the security team members told me everything. The Overseer has been implanting these murderous intentions in the entire vault population without my knowledge. Using the loudspeakers in the dorms instead of just the studios, he subjected everyone to the white noise as they slept. He then implanted combat suggestions he claims came from vault Tech itself. He... he must be completely insane. No observation, no controls. I'm going to have to confront him now, and make him pay for what he's done. Half the vault is dead. The other half, fighting for its life. Good luck to all of us. And may God have mercy on our souls. And once again, Pretty clear sign that there may have been some form of uh, final stand going on here in the recording studio, given it could be locked and sealed, uh, and once again, uh, multiple skeletons, but yes, the existence of the skeletons uh, does suggest it didn't go that well. I do enjoy the final touch, by the way, of uh, yes, one, Malleus not believing Volt Tech could do this, he just thinks the Overseer has lost it, though, we are well aware from the audience's perspective, uh, no, this is well within what Volt Tech would theoretically order. That's absolutely not a surprise in the slightest, and two, Malleus still hasn't in any way realised the original experiment was monstrous. He's just annoyed there wasn't a proper control group, and the fact it was murderous. The fact that, you know, they were doing these experiments full stop, he was still 100% fine with at the end. And yes, now we come back here with the full story, we can piece together what's going on here a little bit better. So uh, we've got barricades set up over here and more barricades over on this side. Uh, clearly, these were the Overseer's guards keeping everybody locked away, though uh, eventually one can reasonably assume they were overrun by the vault, given more and more people were slowly going bananas. As for Malleus himself though, his fate is somewhat unclear. There is no blood splatter in the Overseer's office suggesting either the Overseer or Malleus ended up dead, so yes, precisely what occurred in the final moments of the vault, we can't be entirely certain. 
There is, however, perhaps one last final ray of hope that this vault does give us, which is, uh, when you stumble across it, the vault is already open. Unlike some vaults, you don't need to push the button to make the door open up for you. However, there are no raiders or any other sign of looting inside the vault, suggesting it's not been broken open from the outside, suggesting accordingly someone already opened it from the insides. And whoever that person was, they set up medical equipment, weaponry, ammunition, blood packs for transfusions, etc, etc, right here by the entrance. So, we can't know how many people died or didn't die in this vault precisely, but I'd like to think that yes, one of Malleus' notes did say he was planning to try and escape, and uh, hopefully some people did. Also, I'd never thought about it before, but um, yes indeed, possibly... Even if a few people did get out of the vault, it probably didn't really uh, end too well for them. Because uh, they emerge bleary-eyed into the sunlight and uh, straight ahead of them uh, is old Olnane. There's literally a death claw, like, in sight. Sorry, two death claws in sight the moment they leave the vault. So, uh, okay, possibly it didn't end well for anybody. I never thought about that until just now, but... Even the people who did manage to escape, I suspect it was not a happy ending for them. And just in case you were curious, even if you do indeed get the full story of what's going on inside Vault 92 and come back to Agatha, you can actually tell her what happened with her ancestor, given we did find her violin in the recording studio, and in the recording studio there were also several skeletons and a laser pistol, it probably isn't good news. But instead, anytime you want to, you can now come back to Agatha, Ask her to play the violin for you, and she'll do it live uh, right in front of you, which is, uh, I mean, just bloody lovely. Fine, it's not a new suit of armour, it's not an exciting sexy new gun, though she does give you an exciting sexy new gun, but what have you. But to my mind, the real reward here is uh, a brand new radio station, a new genre of music, and uh, just the lovely moment of uh, seeing someone living a really interesting, unique, distinctive life, out in the wastelander, it's wonderful. So, uh, how about we call it apart there, having tormented poor Agatha, and then eventually, when we felt like it, you know, fulfilling her lifelong dream. And as for next time, I can't help but notice there is one rather large chunk of the map we've barely even touched yet. Despite our exploration of up here in the northeast and over here in the northwest, there is a lovely central chunk right here that we have not really touched yet. So uh, how about next time we do a little bit more wasteland exploration, ultimately leading to us paying a visit to possibly the single most beautiful location in all of Fallout 3, Oasis. So uh, hopefully you're looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been Fallout, Tale of Two Wastelands. Thank you very much, and goodbye. If we just hide the bodies, nobody needs to know about this. Yes! My stupid, stupid plan has worked! It turns out I'm a genius! The giant rat scorpion is not gone! Oh, hang on, there's, there's more yet, though. I'm still being very shocked. Guys, where's the NCR? Nobody needs to know.